Shinani, and was first uh, confronted by people working on speech recognition and to some extent character recognition. And so you have uh, an input, could be an image, for example. Uh, you run through you know, a few layers of a conventional net and the com or whatever it is, and then the thing gives you essentially a map where at every location it tells you, well, there might be you know, a, a queen or a king at that location, and but, well, this particular object it gives you a map of, of where things are. Um, and while you're, um, and, and then you actually produce an output, and, and the output has to, to do things that's called max, non-maximum suppression, which means uh, getting a, a correct interpretation, consistent interpretation of the percept. So in the case of uh, character recognition, you can decide that uh, this is an N, and then this could be a W, and uh, this could be another W, oh, blah, 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 right? But it's not quite consistent. And then you could decide that this is an M, but then this is also a W, but then it overlaps. So you can't really sort of use a piece of ink for, for two different letters. You have to sort of you know, come up with a consistent interpretation. Uh, you know, even though uh, you know, all of those sort of individual objects might be there. So how do you come up with a, a consistent interpretation? And, and what, what you can have there is some sort of cost function that tells you, well, a consistent interpretation here would be something where every piece of it is used once and only once for every character. And I, I can have you know, multiple choices where I put those breaks between, between uh, characters in the word. But there's one that when I, I break things at the right pace, I actually get uh, letters that all make sense. And I get a word that actually occurs in French or English. Um, so, uh, so that's the idea of structure prediction. You basically have a cost function, energy function, actually, on the interpretation. And you have to uh, find an interpretation that minimizes this energy function. And it might in, uh, include a minimization over a latent variable, which in this case would be where you put the boundaries between the characters. It's the same in speech recognition. So, um, so let's go back to this vision example. Um, let's say. Uh, uh, I'm doing training, and I'm being told in this uh, image there is, uh, you know, when uh, when king, when queen, uh, you know, when uh, horse or whatever. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not being told where where they are, or how big they are, is there overlap or whatever. So what I have to do here is some sort of alignment of the the things that were detected in the image, which may be completely inconsistent. There may be lots of candidates. Um, and then align that with the, the series of objects I'm given so, I, so that I get not only a consistent interp interpretation, but a, an interpretation that uh, has all the objects that I know are, are in the image. And that you can see this as the minimization of some energy function with respect to a latent variable. Uh, let me take a, maybe a simpler example to understand. And this goes back to very early work in uh, speech recognition where uh, you want to do speech recognition, so you, you feed uh, a speech signal to a conventional net, let's say, and what the conventional net produces is a sequence of uh, vectors representing some code, some encoding, some embedding, vector uh, representation of the, the speech signal that's uh, at that time, and you get one of those every 10 milliseconds or so, or so about 100 per second. So a given, uh, spoken word will be a sequence of those, uh, of those vectors, but it will be in variable lengths because it depends on the length of the word and it depends on how fast you, you say it and with what accent and everything. Okay, and then let's imagine you want to do nearest neighbor classification. So you know that uh, this is the word seven and you have a sequence of vectors from the word seven that you recorded for someone who spoke the word seven beforehand. And so what you need to do now is to figure out if this word is the same as that word you want to do nearest neighbor, is that you, have, you need to do some sort of time warping to align this sequence of vectors to that sequence of vectors to, to see if they are the same. Uh, that's independent of how fast the word was pronounced. And so you can reduce, you can turn this into a dynamic programming uh, uh, problem, which is a shortest path in a graph kind of search. And that's a minimization over a latent variable. So basically you have your sequence of vectors here, sequence of vectors here, you build a matrix where every crossing in the matrix is the distance between the two corresponding vectors. And then you ask the question, how can I go from this corner to that corner uh, you know, by moving diagonally to the, to the right or up uh, in such a way that uh, the sum of all the distances along the path is minimized. Uh, 
Okay, you can do this with a shortest path algorithm. Uh, then the programming is very efficient. Uh, it's a minimization over a latent variable where the latent variable is the path. Okay, this is a working function basically for between this and that. Um, you can backpropagate gradient through this. So if you have um, if you have a conventional net here that produces those, those vectors, you might want to train the system so that the the conventional net will make those vectors as close as possible to those. And you propagate gradient through this uh, working function, which is very simple to use. Uh, so those things have been used for a long time, um, but they're, they're easy to understand in the context of energy based models. They're just latent variable models uh, of a particular type. And it's been used a lot for you know, different applications in pen writing recognition, speech recognition were the first ones. Um, here is a more recent uh, example. So this is a, a very cool uh, vision system architecture for detection, object detection called DITER. That was uh, uh, proposed by Carillon et al. So he was, um, uh, Nicolas Carillon was a, a resident PhD student at FAIR in Paris. He's now a postdoc at NYU and he's uh, soon joining FAIR in, in New York as a research scientist. And he proposed this architecture it's very nice. You, you take an image running through a conventional net, so you get a bunch of dense image features. You get you know, some 3D array, which for each location tells you, here is what I think is here. Um, and, and they're just you know, vectors of some dimension. And then you plug that through, you, you consider each of those feature vectors are as, as tokens, and you, you, you feed this through a transformer uh, architecture. So what is a transformer architecture? I'm sure you, many of you have heard the word before. Um, it's a kind of complicated internal structure, but the only thing you need to know about, about it is that whatever function a transformer computes is equivariant to permutation. So you feed it a bunch of tokens, vectors, you run through the neural net, you get the same number of output tokens, they might be different dimensions. Uh, but the point of it is, if you permute the uh, uh, incoming vectors, you get the same result with the same permutation. Okay, so, uh, is equivalent to permutation. Um, and that's really important when what you're trying to capture are uh, the, the tasks you're trying to fulfill or solve uh, is basically has to do with relationships between those tokens as opposed to their individual content or, or, or things like that. So if you have a collection of objects and you know that you know one object cannot occur simultaneously with, with another one, um, uh, or it can occur, but not in a particular relationship. Like can have, you can have a person on, you know, sitting on a horse. You rarely have a horse sitting on a person, for example. Uh, you cannot have, you know, two persons exactly the same location. Um, you can't, uh, you can't have uh, in the same scene, you know, a person that you know is this tall in the image and another one that is this tall in the image. That's inconsistent. So there's a lot of things like this which are sort of constraints in the world. Uh, and, and the transformer is really good at capturing these kind of, uh, uh, these kind of things and, and, and tell you, you know, what is kind of the most consistent interpretation, if you want. Um, so the way uh, this thing uh, uh, works is that you, you take those, uh, this transformer and it produces, the output of the transformer is that for every input token, it produces a uh, prediction for what object that input token was uh, or is and a prediction for a bonding box or even a mask for that object. Okay, so you get a number of candidates like this. Um, so there's no object here and you know, blah, blah, blah. And then when you want to train the system, you tell it, um, well, there are two birds in the image, and you might even tell it where the bonding boxes are, but uh, in some cases you don't have that information. What you have to do basically is sort of align the the, the uh, desired output of the system with you know, whatever things it produced, and that involves basically matching tokens with each other, because you don't know in which order they're going to appear in your, in your list of candidates. You don't know in which order you, you put them, so you have to kind of match you know, which object in my desired list of objects matches the ones that my system is proposing, uh, and that's again uh, a kind of alignment, if you want, that you can think of as uh, relaxation or minimization with respect to a related variable. So that's the overall architecture. You have a conventional net. It produces an array of uh, candidates. Um, there's something called positional encoding that you know, basically indicates in which location everything is. You run through this uh, 
uh, transformer architecture. So, so each vector here is uh, a separate token. You get a bunch of tokens on the output. Um, and then there is this other thing. So those are object queries. So they are, you know, here you put, um, is, there, is there a bird at, you know, is there a bird anywhere? Um, is there another bird anywhere? Um, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then you kind of match with this and, and, and you have to do this sort of uh, alignment of, uh, of uh, where, th where things are during, um, during training using a technique called uh, synchron map, which I'm not gonna go into. But, um, but it works really well, it's amazing actually, the, the way it can uh, so the det detect objects that overlap each other and things like this. So there's been a, uh, th this work has been, has been out for uh, three years or so, and there's been a lot of uh, follow-up work that were inspired by this, by you know, other groups like Microsoft and, and Google, etc. So pretty dense um, uh, object segmentation. Uh, let's skip over this. Yes. So, because you mentioned the Dexter tool in the first uh, lecture, but this, so how is that different? Uh, so there is several different approaches. The the one I showed, the demo I showed, is uh, is from Detectron two, and this one uses uh, a convolutional net um, as the feature detector, just like Beta, uh, and uh, has another uh, thing on top of it called Mask RCNN. So RCNN is a particular architecture for detection, and uh, Mask RCNN is one that produces a mask for every object. And, uh, and it's trained with a combination of uh, free supervised and weakly supervised uh, data. We don't have the mask for every object, but it, the system kind of figures it out. So it's a, a form of structure prediction. The difference is that in, a, in sort of classical object detection, the post processing that decides, okay, I have two, uh, you know, have a basket of fruits and I have two peaches that overlap each other. Is that two peaches or just a single one? Uh, you have to do this sort of non-maximum suppression thing, and, and normally it's done by hand, and it's a post-processing that is sort of hand, handcrafted and programmed. What Dieter does is basically replaces it by a transformer, which means you can backpropagate gradient through this and, and, and make the post-processing differentiable and trainable. That's the main difference. So, uh, so the transformer, when good thing about it, is this uh, equivalent to permutation? Permutation, that's the essential characteristics of it. Yeah. But is it obvious that it's always a good feature? That, I mean, the sun is always above the radioactive spatial relationships between them. Yeah, but there is this trick that I glossed over called positional encoding. <laughs> so positional encoding basically, in addition to the features, uh, so think of this as a 3D array, right? For every location, you have a feature vector that indicates the content of you know, the window underneath that, um, that, that, feature, that, that feature vector, that location. In addition to this, you concatenate with this a bunch of planes that indicate um, basically encode using a uh, very simple like sinusoid uh, sort of uh, function uh, encodes the location of that feature within the image. Okay, so it breaks the permutation invariant, equivariance, uh, but it allows the system to basically use uh, you know uh, relative positions of uh, feature vectors to kind of make sense of, of an image. So you're not going to have like a car flying in the in the air and things like that, or rarely. So let's skip this. Um, okay, now let's, let's talk about the more interesting things. Um, various EDM architectures. So I'm gonna talk about latent variable models, joint embedding architectures, and joint embedding predictive architectures, which are basically a combination of those two. So I sort of made the, the case uh, uh, yesterday, I think, or maybe the first day, that um, generative architectures were probably a bad idea because um, if you want to predict uh, y from x, or capture the dependency between x and y. What you can do is run x to an encoder and then have a predictor that predicts uh, y and then measure the divergence between the predictor of y and the observed y. The problem with, with that is that if you want to apply this to things like uh, learning from video, right? So learning how the world works by watching videos. Um, you know, like the baby example I was, I was talking about uh, the first day where you, know, you learn intuitive physics and and things like that, like basically just watching the world go by. Um, the problem with this is that you have to model every single detail of the world, and there may be a whole bunch of details that are basically unpredictable, or so difficult to predict that you don't want to spend any resources predicting it, right? So, um, you know, the example I use usually is, uh, you know, around us, we're surrounded by uh, uh, 
for, uh, foliage and, and you know trees and things like this, and they move in the wind. And there's there's no way you're going to spend all your uh, you know neurons predicting the precise movement of uh, uh, all the leaves and all the trees because of the of the wind, particularly because it's completely irrelevant to any task you might you might want to uh, to accomplish. So what I'm going to um, uh, argue for instead is uh, what I call the joint embedding uh, architecture, and this is a particular type called uh, joint embedding predictive architecture, where Y also goes to an encoder. And the role of this encoder is to basically eliminate all the stuff that is too complicated to predict or model, and only extract information that uh, is predictable. Okay, so the stuff that's too hard to predict uh, will be eliminated essentially by this encoder. And so you, you train the system to uh, basically make SX and SY as informative as possible about the inputs, but also as predictable as possible from each other. And if, if you think about what, uh, what we do as, uh, I shouldn't say we as physicists, because I'm not a really physicist, but um, you know, what you do as physicists, is that uh, when we're trying to model a phenomenon in the world, we're, we're trying to figure out what are the relevant um, quantities and what other type of characteristics can I just completely ignore because they are irrelevant to the prediction I want to make. So you're, you're Newton, you're trying to predict the trajectories of, uh, of planets, um, and you quickly realize there's only three things that matter, it's uh, mass, uh, initial position, initial velocity, and the mass of other you know, bodies around it. Uh, you know, it's only kind of basically three three variables for 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 anything. And you can predict the trajectory. The composition of the planet is irrelevant. The shape of the planet is irrelevant, or whether it's a planet or not. Actually, all of those are completely irrelevant. The things that matter is basically just three. Um, I mean, it's more than three. It's uh, actually seven. I, I would say seven variables. Um, and the rest is irrelevant to predict trajectories. Um, and the amount of information that's contained in the composition, shape, and everything of a planet is absolutely gigantic. Okay? Out of this, you have to discover what are the seven variables that actually matter. Um, so, or if you have two bodies, you know, it's 14. Uh, so, that's what we do as uh, intelligent beings. We, we figure out what are the relevant quantities that or, or, or characteristic or interesting things that we need to extract versus all the other stuff that we can ignore or we can view as noise or nuisance variables or whatever you want to call them. Um, and that's the role of this encoder. Okay. So and you don't want to do this. Just to understand fully this example. I mean, if you are giving some uh, in your data the, the structure of the planet and asking, I know everything and did by t, what happens at time t plus one? I mean, this thing would still be able to predict that the composition of the planet has not changed, and so may still want to keep it as a prediction. Yeah, so <clears throat> what I suggest is that the stuff that really matters that you want to predict is things that change, essentially. Right? Um, and you know, if something is constant between those two things, it should basically be eliminated from the, from the whole thing because it's irrelevant for the prediction. Yeah. Can, can I add on that also with the example you gave? This, you know, with respect to what we do, this is a dynamical process. If I am the, the, you know, we don't notice the, the leaves, as you say, but if the wind picks up, right, we'll notice that something is going on. And they'll move more. Right, they move yeah. more, and that, then we're going to pay attention because that could be something, you know, that leads to something else. Yeah, that's right. We so have a very high-level abstract representation of the, the quantity of motion without actually having all the details, uh, having to predict, you know, to run Navier Stokes with cha yeah, yeah. chaotic behavior at the, you know, at a very low level, right? Um, right. So, so that's the. So if it, uh, like going back to this example, uh, if you're like say x is the uh, is the only information about the planet at time t, and yeah. y is only information about the planet at time t plus one. Yeah. It seems that the best way to succeed would actually to be to ignore the things that change, and keep the things that don't change because then the encoding is very simple and they would the prediction would be perfect, right? So yeah, uh, but it would be useless. It would be useless. Yes. How do you prevent the system from being useless? That's yeah, that's question. right. So basically, predict change. So so you you need, you need to somehow tell the system this is what they care about, right? Yeah. Because if you in just in this architecture, you you might 
find encoders that uh, uh, that keep the true. The, the so basically, I'm, I'll be coming to this, but you can imagine there is a first layer in that system that basically doesn't have a predictor. It's just trying to do a joint embedding between those, those two things, mm -hmm. and it's trying to predict, you know, what is common between X and Y, mm -hmm. uh, and then it's going to extract this. And what you feed to the next layer is the difference, okay. right? So not so you basically eliminate all the easily predictable stuff, and the next layer up will only uh, model the uh, the residual. Think of it. Uh, I mean, those are concept, connect with concepts in neuroscience called predict, uh, predictive coding, but they are a little different. Okay, so we have those two uh, those two rival uh, architectures, and uh, if we want to have a, a multimodality in the uh, in the prediction, um, there's sort of uh, two ways we can obtain it. So the first way is we eliminate information about why. Uh, in the representation here, which means there's, there's going to be a whole bunch of y's that have the same energy because the representation of y is not going to change while we stay in the, the same uh, invariant uh, uh, manifold of that, of that neural net, that encoder. Um, so that's one way of handling modality. And then another way of handling modality, which is more in the generative uh, uh, context, is with a latent variable. And I already talked about this uh, in the first lecture, where you can have a latent variable that parameterizes the set of all possible predictions. And if I give you an X and a Y, you can find the value of the latent uh, variable that minimizes the prediction error. It will give you a point in that, in that Z space. And that will give you the best prediction within the manifold of you know, plausible predictions that is closest to the observation. So that's another way of handling. Um, so this is a kind of non-deterministic model, if you want. Um, and, uh, it's not necessarily probabilistic. It depends, you know, if you don't have a distribution over the set, it's not, not probabilistic. Um, but it's certainly non-deterministic. And, uh, and this one um, uh, is multimodal, but is, is, is non-probabilistic because you cannot invert this, this, uh, this thing. So if you want to uh, use a Gibbs formula to compute P over Y given X, for example, here, you will have to invert the function of this network. And it's not invertible because it has invariance properties, right? It's, uh, it's not a, a invertible function, it sort of eliminates information. So you can't basically turn this into a distribution. So in the space of two slides, I've argued against guarantee models and against a probabilistic model. Two pillars of machine learning. Um, so ultimately what you want to do is something like this, what I call the JEPA, Joint Embedding Predictive Architecture which uh, handles multimodality in two different ways. And those two different ways are, are both necessary. You cannot, there's a number of things that you cannot do if you use either one or the other. Um, so you have to do both. And uh, you take the input variable, run into an encoder, um, take the variable you want to model the dependency of, uh, of a vex, run into a, another encoder, or maybe the same encoder, they could be the same or not, depending on the nature of those signals. And what you're going to try to do is predict the representation of y from the representation of x. And that prediction may not be possible to do exactly. So you're going to put a latent variable to pick up the slack. So the latent variable is containing the information necessary to predict sy that is not contained in sx. Okay. So uh, for example, um, um, I'm working on self-driving cars. And what I'd like to do is being able to, to some extent, do some prediction about the trajectories of the cars around me. Is the car next to me going to change lane? In which case I have to probably slow down. Uh, you know, um, the car in front of me going to, you know, coming to a fork in the road, is it going to turn left or right? Uh, is it going to accelerate or brake? You know, things like that, right? Um, so, um, so I observe uh, a few seconds of a video of uh, the cars around me. I want you to predict the next few seconds or the state of the world in you know a couple of seconds from now. So I can sort of drive defensively if you want. Um, and bordering the road, again, there is you know trees with leaves moving in the wind and all that stuff, right? So the encoder is going to eliminate all that because I, I don't want to spend any resources predicting all of that stuff. Uh, or you know the, the color of the, the the shop that is you know bordering the the street and things like that. What I do want to model is the position of all moving objects, including pedestrians and things like that. Um, and, and those would be, you know, have relatively predictable trajectories. And then simultaneously, I'm going to train some predictor to predict 
the the future position of all those all, all those objects, but I won't have to predict the position of the leaves and the trees because of the land cover. But I need a latent variable because I can't tell a priori whether the car in front of me is going to take the the left or, or right branch in the fork in the road. And so there is some uncertainty, even in that, at that level of representation, that I need to be able to encode in some, um, some latent variable. If I don't have this latent variable, and I have to make a single prediction uh, for the trajectory of the car, I would have to predict that the car goes to the left with probability one half and to the right with probability one half. And so I get some sort of blurry car uh, predicted in front of me. I don't want that. Um, okay, so if you want to train one of those joint embedding uh, uh, joint embedding architecture, there's been a whole bunch of uh, a lot of interesting work over the last uh, thirty years, <laughs> but more over the last five years or four years uh, on contrasting methods for joint embedding architectures, and it worked pretty well. Okay, so to remind you, um, uh, contrasting methods are those where you have this energy function, you push down the points that are the training samples, and then you generate other points and you push up their energy. Um, and this is used in the context of something called Siamese networks. So um, Siamese network is a particular type of joint embedding architecture where you have uh, two neural nets that are identical. They share the same parameters, right? So you feed them with two images, for example. That could be sort of different versions of the same image. Um, and then you, you take the output representations and you try for images that you know are semantically similar for some reason, you try to make the representations as similar to each other as possible. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, this model can collapse in the sense that if you only train on images, pairs of images that you know are similar, the system will ignore the inputs and just produce constant representations and give you zero energy for everything, which is not a good model. You want higher energy for things you don't train on. Right? So in contrasting methods, uh, so the first uh, work on this was back to the early 90s. This is a uh, paper I was uh, co-author of uh, at Bell Labs. Um, and we use this for uh, signature recognition, signature verification. Uh, there was some uh, more recent work from my group at NYU, um, signature primary and Excel, um, on kind of uh, recycling those ideas for, for kind of new examples. And then since uh, 2014, but more in 2019, there's been a, a whole bunch of work um, some of them from uh, FAIR, so those three are from FAIR. This one is from uh, Google, uh, Google Brain, and they, where, where basically those methods have been sort of revived and have been shown to work really well for pre-training a system to recognize uh, images from essentially uh, unlabeled uh, images. And, you know, they, they differ by various things which I'm not going to go into, but um, but that's sort of a, a bit of a menagerie of uh, so, so various things. Simsiam, that comes from FAIR, SimClear from Google, Suave from FAIR Paris, uh, Obo from uh, um, Research Lab in France. Um, uh, it's, I can't remember the company, they were from. But, um, but here's how it works. Um, so if, you, if you're going to use contrasting methods, you're going to use some sort of loss function that pushes them on the energy, which is the similarity between the vectors of uh, pairs of images that you know are, are, are similar, and then you have, you're going to come up with contrastive pairs. So those would be distorted versions of the same image, right? So you take an image, that's Y, then you distort it, that's your X. Um, change the scale, change the colors a little bit, uh, you will squeeze it in some ways, uh, blur it, whatever. Um, and then you're going also to uh, have uh, contrastive samples, so things where you know the two images are different, and you're going to just pick two random examples from your training set, ImageNet in that case. Um, so the bad news with this is that you need to have a way of doing data augmentation, um, of, of you know, generating multiple views of the same image, basically. Uh, so that requires a little bit of knowledge about the problem you're trying to solve. So you train the system with you know, whatever loss function you want. Uh, people use info and CD, most clear, for example, and for others, they use others. And you show pairs of things that are similar. You push the two representations, the two output vectors near each other by propagating the gradient, update the weights. And then you take a dissimilar pair, and then you push away those two vectors using some sort of cost 
that you've decided, maybe something like this with a margin, the hinge loss. It could be something else. Most people use influence C, which I talked about yesterday. Um, and then once you're, you're done with this uh, uh, self-supervised pre-training phase, so for example, you would, you would do, use a convolutional net architecture, ResNet 50, the output of it is a, a vector of dimension 2048. Um, for most of those techniques, you have to project this to a lower dimension and then apply the, uh, this uh, distance, uh, contrasted distance criterion in, in that lower dimensional space because it doesn't work very really well in high dimensional space. So that's called projector. And then once you're done with it, you, you remove the top, you just use the, 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 the bottom encoder, if you want, and you feed this to a, a classifier, for example, a linear classifier, which you train in supervised mode, and you measure the performance. And what happens with this is that, um, yeah, so this is the kind of cost that, uh, for example, Sinclair uh, uses is info NCE. So it's kind of a log softmax where the positive sample is here, and then the negative samples are in the uh, log of some of the exponentials. Um, and you can include the positive sample or not. Um, it works in both cases. Um, and this works, um, this works quite, quite well uh, in the sense that you can pre-train those systems with uh, ImageNet uh, training samples with augmentations. Uh, you don't need to know the labels. Uh, and then you chop off the, chop off the top, uh, plug a, a linear classifier to a single layer, train it for cross entropy. Um, so it's basically logistic regression with, let's say, a subset of ImageNet. And uh, and you get much better performance than if you test it purely if you train purely supervised on that subset. You can also train on the full image net and uh, and you get performance that you know is pretty much on par with what you would get with purely supervised. You don't get any loss or a little bit of loss, but not much. If the pre-training is done on a very large data set, you actually get an improvement. I'll, I'll show you some examples later. So uh, that's a, an example where unsupervised pre-training really works for images, and the type of unsupervised pre-training I, I told you about yesterday, the, the sort of masking autoencoder methods, until three months ago, didn't work at all. Three months ago, um, the team at FAIR managed to make this work, but using uh, transformers, not conventional nets, because it's easier to mask inputs from, from transformers. Uh, there are sort of uh, methods that are a little similar to this, but they don't really are explicitly contrastive. Basically, what uh, the basic idea of this is you, you, you take an input that you run through this branch, uh, and then you take the output vectors here, and, and you run a clustering algorithm, okay, KBs or something like that. So you have a bunch of prototypes that correspond to, you know, kind of the clusters of uh, vectors that come out when you run your, your training set through this branch. Um, and you can have something like, I don't know, 100,000 clusters or something like this, right? And now what you do is uh, you, take, you take an example, run it through this, you get a giant vector of uh, 100,000 dimensions where it you know, tells you how far you are from each of the prototypes. Uh, run this with a softmax that gives you a sort of probability distribution. You use this as a target to basically train this guy, okay? So this guy runs through this and you know, it's going to produce some uh, classification also, and you use the the cluster output as targets to to train it. That's called a, kind of a distillation uh, method. And there's sort of various versions of this: uh, cluster, cluster plus, uh, or deep cluster, deep cluster plus, and uh, something called SWAG, which is sort of a symmetric version of this, which uh, was developed at Paris. Um, and and this works really well. Uh, in fact, it worked so well that there was a large-scale experiment that was done at, uh, at FAIR where this uh, system of this type was trained on 1 billion random images from Instagram. You just uh, observe the public post from Instagram for about an hour and you get a billion photos. Um, completely un uh, uncurated. Uh, you train using those sort of uh, self-supervised pre-training, side misnet type uh, algorithm with it. Uh, and then you chop off the last layer and uh, train on uh, ImageNet. And you get better performance than you would get if you just train on ImageNet in purely supervised mode. Uh, 
Uh, if only you use 10% of the image net, you, you already get like pretty good, pretty good performance. Similar to what you get with purely supervised, without any tricks. And it, and it transfers to other tasks, so you, you get good performance also on fine grain classification, on objects uh, detection, and things like that. Um, a similar idea was used for pre-training uh, speech recognition systems. So it's a, also kind of a joint embedding type um, method where you run the speech signal through a conditional net, which produces a, a series of uh, vectors. Then you run those vectors through a transformer, so it's very much like the, the detail architecture I was like, telling you about, but this is for speech. Um, and you, you mask uh, some inputs, for example this one, and you try to predict uh, that um, uh, output from the other ones. So basically, can I, can I predict um, neighboring vectors from, from myself or vice versa? So it's kind of a cross prediction kind of thing. So you know, one of those is an X and the other one is a Y. The one you observe is an X, the one you don't is, is Y. And what you can do with this is you treat, the, say again. You're predicting the mask. You're predicting the mask uh, input or yeah. the, the, uh, okay. from the output? From so the, yeah. Just the hours. Uh, uh, you mean those hours? Yes, so. Yeah, I think this is a quanti uh, quantization. So okay. it's kind of discretized, uh, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, these are quantized representations. So it's like swab a little bit, right? You, you quantize the output vector using vector quantization. Okay. Um, and then use those as um, as target as uh, so I don't remember if they are as used are as as inputs to predict the mass one or the other one. Uh, I think that's the, that's the way it was. And uh, and what you can do with this is that whereas previously you had to use something like a hundred hours of labeled speech data to train a speech recognition system, with uh, self supervised pre training you can get the same performance with only 10 minutes of labeled data, right? So you record a bunch of people for a total of, of 10 minutes, uh, have someone label this, and then you train a speech recognition system. If it's been pre-trained on uh, uh, speakers from, from that, from the same language, um, it's, you know, it's gonna work to the same level of performance. So this, um, it turned out to be really essential for having a multilingual speech recognition system. So you don't want a, a separate speech recognition system for every language um, because it's kind of expensive, first of all, but, but also uh, there's a lot of commonalities between different languages, and so you want to exploit the redundancy between those languages, so what you want is one giant model that does everything. And that's, what, that's the kind of technique that basically allows um, to do this. So, so there are speech recognition systems now uh, at, uh, at Meta that um, you know, can understand basically hundreds of languages. Um, okay, this is the cool stuff, regularized methods for joint embedding architectures. Okay, the problem with contrastive methods is that, uh, and I mentioned that before, when the representation space, the dimension of Y space increases, if you have an infinitely flexible energy function, then the number of points you're gonna have to push up goes exponentially with dimension. So this is why they use the projection here? Yes, because, yeah, exactly. So the, the reason why Sinclair, for example, uses a projection head where the dimension at the output is 256 is because you can't do it between, in 2048. Uh, or you can, but it costs you an arm and leg computationally. And in the end, you only get embeddings that uh, span a 200 dimensional space anyway. Um, so there's a lot of experimental work that is being done now. There's papers on archive on it, uh, including from my book at, at, uh, at Meta, that tries to figure out like, what is the uh, embedding dimension of uh, what comes out of uh, something like, like, like Sinclair or, or other methods, or non-contrastive non method of the type I'm going to talk about. And basically, with contrastive method, you can, if you train on the image net with distortion, you can get about, about 200 or 300 dimensions. So you take the the, the matrix of all representation factors for the entire training set, and you do an SVD, and you look at how many secret values are large, and you basically only have 200 or so, regardless of the dimension of the embedding space. 